Chapter 4, Section 2, Congruence and Triangles. When two figures are congruent, you're going to have corresponding angles that are congruent and corresponding sides that are congruent. The first example asks us to write a congruence statement for the triangles below. Identify all parts, pairs of congruent corresponding parts. Notice we are given triangle XYZ and we're given triangle HK. H, J, K. Now, when you look at the angles first, notice that angle Y of the first triangle has one arc and angle K of the second triangle has one arc. That means, remember, that these two angles are congruent. So angle Y would be congruent to angle K, angle X would be congruent to angle H, and angle Z would be congruent to angle J because it is given to us in the picture. Now, this also, so we have corresponding angles. We also need to see if we have corresponding congruent sides. Now, look at the tick marks tell us the side lengths. Remember one tick mark, a side with one tick mark will be congruent to another side with one tick mark in the same picture. So notice that Y and Z, uh, Segment YZ or side YZ, it would be congruent to side KJ because they each have one tick mark. Side XY would be congruent to side HK. And side XZ would be congruent to side HJ. That is just based off of the fact that we have tick marks. Now, it also asked me to write a congruence statement for the triangles below. A congruence statement is going to state that the whole triangle XYZ is congruent to the whole triangle HJK. But when we say that these two triangles are congruent, it's very important that when you write the congruence statement that your corresponding angles are in the same position on, when you're naming one triangle as when you're naming the other triangle. So notice that X and H are both coming first. That is important because X is congruent to H. Y and K are coming next because Y is congruent to K. And then Z and J are coming because Z and J are congruent. Now, you don't have to say X, Y, Z. You could have said Z, X, Y. You should, could have named the first one triangle Z, X, Y. But if you name the first one ZXY, then you would have to name the second one JHK because Z has to be in the same position as J, Y has to be in the same position as K, and X has to be in the same position as H. So there are actually three correct ways to write this. However, your corresponding angles have to be in the same position when naming the triangles. So this is one valid way, and like I said, there are three other ways that you could do it. The next example, we're given uh, quadrilaterals A, B, C, and D, and then we're given uh, K, J, H, and L. Notice that it tells us in the drop diagram A, B, C, D is congruent to K, J, H, L. Look at the way they've given me a congruent statement. The order again matters. So because A comes in the first is the first letter naming the first quadrilateral, A would be corresponding to K, or A would be congruent to K. B would be congruent to J, C would be congruent to H, and D would be congruent to L, because remember, order does matter when you're writing a congruent statement. A asks us to find the value of X. If you look the value of X, it is for the side KJ. Well, notice the side KJ, if you look at the congruent statement that they tell us, the ABCD is congruent to KJHL. KJ are the first two letters of the um, second quadrilateral. So we need to find the segment of the first two letters of the first triangle uh, quadrilateral, which are AB. So because of the congruent statement that they tell us, I can say that AB is congruent to KJ. Now, we are given that AB is 9 centimeters, 
and we are given that kj is 4x minus 3 centimeters. Because these two sides are corresponding and congruent, we can set those two values equal to each other to solve for x. I need to add 9 to both sides now to give me 12 equals 4x. Now divide both sides by 4 and you get 3 equals x. So I have found the value of x. B asks us to find the value of y. If you notice, y is the measure of the angle at h. Based on the congruent statements, I can say that angle A is congruent to angle K, angle B is congruent to angle J, C is congruent to angle H, and angle D is congruent to angle L. I am given the y value in angle H, so I need to find, set that equal to the measure of angle C in the other quadrilateral. So I can say that 113 from angle C is equal to 5y minus 12 from the corresponding angle, angle H. Same thing as before, now I just need to solve for y. I need to add 12 to both sides first to give me 125 equals 5y. Now divide both sides by 5 and you find that 25 equals y. So I found the value of x and I have found the value of y. The third angles theorem states that if two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then the third angles are also congruent. So that says if angle A in the diagram below is congruent to angle D and angle B is congruent to E. So if we're given that those two sets of angles are congruent to each other, then we can say that the third angles of each triangle, angle C and angle F, are congruent to each other also. This makes sense if you take a second to stop and think about this because we know that the three angles of a triangle have to add up to 180. So if we have the same two values for the two angles, then the third angle is going to have to be the same value for a triangle that has the same two angle measures given. We know that they have to add up to 180, so we know that if we are given two of the same, then the third one is also going to have to be the same as the other third one. This example asks us to find the value of x. Notice in this uh, diagram, we're given triangle ABC and we're given triangle DFE. Now, the tick marks or the arch arches tell us that angle A and angle D are congruent. Because angle A measures 22 degrees, I can say that angle D measures 22 degrees. Likewise, it tells me that angle B is 87 degrees. Because angle B is 87 degrees, I can tell that angle E would be 87 degrees also. I could also use the third angles theorem and say that angle C has to be equal to for the angle F, 4x plus 15. There are several different ways that you can go about doing this problem. There's not one right way to do it. There is one right answer, but you can think of it several ways. The way that I'm going to set it up is I'm going to say that angle C is congruent to angle F. If I look at angle at the triangle ABC, I'm given two angles, and when I'm given two angles, I can find the third angle. So I'm going to use the fact that the 22 degree angle plus the 89, 87 degree angle plus angle C is equal to 180 because the three angles of a triangle add up to equal 180. I can combine my whole numbers and get 109 plus C equals 180. And when I subtract 109 from both sides, I find that angle C equals 71. Because angle C equals 71, I can tell that angle F is also going to equal 71 because the third angles theorem states that the, if your two angles are congruent to another triangle, two angles, then the third angles also have to be congruent to each other. So I can say that 4x plus 15 equals 71. Subtract 15 from both sides and you get 4x equals 56. Now divide by 4 on both sides and you get that x equals 14. The next example says to decide whether the triangles are congruent and to justify your reasoning. First of all, notice that they give me that all three sides, all three sides of EFG have a congruent corresponding side on triangle HGJ. 
So I know that my sides are going to be corresponding and congruent. Now I have to look at my angles. We are given that angle F is congruent to angle H because both of those angles measure 58 degrees. If you look at angle, the two angles formed in the middle where the two triangles are meeting, angle E, G, F, and angle H, G, J are vertical angles. And because they are vertical angles, we know that they are congruent. So based on the diagram given, I can say that angle E, G, F is congruent to J, G, H because they are vertical angles. Now I have that two angles of the triangle are con congruent and corresponding. Because I know that two angles are congruent, I can say that angle E is congruent to angle J because of the third angle's theorem. Now that I have, I was given that all of my sides are congruent, and now that I have found that all three angles have a congruent corresponding angle, I can write a congruent statement saying that triangle F, G, E is congruent to triangle H, G, J. Remember, you can't just write those in any order. They have to be in the correct corresponding congruent, so um, angles order. So F is congruent to H, G is congruent to G, and E is congruent to J. So it has to be, now it doesn't have to be in that order. Corresponding parts just have to be in the same position for each name of the triangles. The last example is a proof. We are given that a segment MN is congruent to segment QP. We're also given that MN is parallel to PQ. And we are told that O is the midpoint of MQ and of PN segments. We are asked to prove that triangle MNO is congru congruent to triangle QPO. Remember, we always start our proofs with what we are given, so I'm just going to rewrite that segment MN is congruent to segment QP, MN is parallel to QP, and that O is the midpoint of MQ and PN. The reason why I can say that is that it is given to us. Now, the one thing that sticks out a lot to me, based on what we are given, is that O is the midpoint of MQ and, and of PN. Remember, the midpoint means that it cuts a segment into two congruent parts. So if O is the midpoint of MQ, I can say that MO is congruent to OQ. And if O is the midpoint of PN, I can say that NP, or I'm sorry, NO is congruent to PO. Now, I can say this simply based on the definition of midpoint. Because of those two um, statements that I just made, MO is congruent to OQ and NO is congruent to PO, I can say I have that all three sides of my triangle have congruent corresponding parts on the other triangle that I'm trying to prove they're congruent. So sides I don't have to worry about anymore. However, I don't know anything about the angles. Now, one thing that you might be wondering is why in the world would they tell us that MN is parallel to PQ? What does that have to do with triangles? Well, it's not directly going to tell us that the triangles are congruent, but it can tell us something about the angles. If you notice, MN and PQ are being cut by not one, but two different transversals. You can look at NP cutting through diagonally, and you can also look at MQ cutting through diagonally. You also can look at the fact that MON, the angle MON, and the angle POQ are vertical angles. So based on those two statements, I can say that I have three congruent corresponding angles. Now, let's write that down in our proof. I'm going to say that angle MON is congruent to angle POQ. And I can say that because of the vertical angles theorem, which states that vertical angles are congruent. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to use that, those parallel lines. Remember when parallel lines are cut by a transversal, 
I know that alternate interior, which is what we have, the relationship between angle N, M, N, O, and angle O, P, Q, and angle N, M, O, and angle O, Q, P, I can say that those two sets of angles are congruent because of the alternate interior angles theorem. Anytime you are given that you have parallel lines, just a quick side note, anytime you're given that you have parallel lines and you're trying to prove congruence of triangles, you're probably looking for a transversal. I have that all three of my sides have congruent corresponding parts. I also have that all three of my angles are congruent and corresponding. So now I can write that triangle MNO is congruent to triangle QPO because of the definition of congruent triangles. The definition of congruent triangles, remember back to, at the beginning of the lesson, we said that congruent triangles are going to have congruent corresponding angles and congruent corresponding sides. The assignment for today is on page 206. You're doing numbers 10 through 28 even and number four, numbers 42 through 56 even.